Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Alessandro, and Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a privilege to be here representing not only Brazil, but Latin America. There's a bunch of Brazilian and Latin American surgeons in the audience. I'm very proud of it. And I hope I can represent you well here in this uh, debate. So it's a debate. It's not uh, simply a lecture. And I think uh, my opponents, I hope you can still talk to me after that. So this is my disclosure. Uh, are we really reducing surgery in the biological era? So. Population-based studies in referral centers worldwide, they're saying that yes, maybe we are reducing colectomy rates in ureterative colitis. But you know, to these findings be apl applicable to the clinical practice, it's a completely another, another story. It depends on where you are. So we, I'm in Latin America, okay? So we have difficulties in accessing healthcare some places. So in, in our uh, continent, the biologic penetration for ureterative colitis is very low. With that, we are not changing the natural history of ulcerative colitis because our surgical rates are still stable. And this is like the representation of a systematic review of a full continent. If you're in Canada, for example, you'll see that overall colectomy rates are decreasing in the biological era. You can see it here, but mostly due to reduction in elective operations because emergency surgeries did not change over time. What's my point by doing this? My point is that, this is the, maybe the most important slide that I'll show you today. This is what's happening with ulcerative colitis today. There's a huge experience, not only with anti-TNFs, but also with other biologics. And this, of course, delays the indication for surgery in ulcerative colitis. So they persist on that. They associate this with the fear of patients to have uh, uh, stomas. And by that, when they refer finally the patients after three or four biologics to us, the patients are in bad nutritional status, marinated with steroids, and these cases are more severe. And therefore, we're going to have an increase in complications. If this is caused by biologics per se, versus the delay by the insistence with these drugs, it still needs to be known. Let me start with, uh, as I'm uh, the first to speak in this debate, I'm just going to show you an overview of what we're discussing here. So the first stage, you just do the pouch, no, st no stoma. Second stage, you construct the pouch, put an end, uh, a loop ileostomy there. I, I bet that uh, Professor Bemelman will talk a lot about the modified two stage where you do colectomy first, uh, an end ileostomy, and then you do the pouch without uh, a loop ileostomy to protect. And I'm going to be the old fashioned here to defeat the three stage procedure. And I hope I can convince you that this is probably the safest uh, way to go for the majority of patients. If you go to the ECHO guidelines in ulcerative colitis, uh, is the first stage pouch surgery, one stage pouch surgery, really acceptable nowadays? So as long as we discussed all the data that is published, I would say that no, this is not acceptable, at least in adults today. I would say that uh, in the patients that we are receiving today, marinated with steroids, bad nutritional status, a lot of biologics, it's not safe to do that. This is probably more for the surgeon's ego as from data of safety, whatever. And I, I have the privilege here today to learn something from a pediatric surgeon, and I hope then you can teach us. because. Maybe, as you said before the debate, you are the one to be sacrificed here. So I hope you can bring us some pediatric data to show that I'm wrong. But in adults, I won't recommend it. What about this two-stage pouch surgery? Here's the Professor Bemerman with his golden stapler. Everybody knows that. And I bet he, he's going to say he has no disclosures. But anyway, what do you do with this? You only have the restorative proctocolectomy. This is probably for patients with associated dysplasia or carcinoma, patients without biologics, good nutritional status, no anemia. This is an acceptable procedure in selected patients for sure. But what about the new kid on the block, the modified to stage that I bet he's gonna explore more. So no loop ileostomy. So this is a procedure that is young. Uh, Professor Bemman seems young, that probably after three or four Botox procedures uh, in the picture below. But anyway, there's still doubts there. Do we need uh, to study it more, to have access to knowledge. If it's safer than the double stapling, we can do suture reinforcement. What are the advantages of that? So is this again for us, for surgeons, or for the patient's safety? So I, 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 I'm really keen to understand what Professor Bemelman will show with his experience. Three-stage procedure is safety first. It's like an airline, so we cannot uh, make it wrong because these patients are already very sick. And we can add morbidity to them if we do uh, uh, a different thing. As I said, the majority of these patients, they come malnourished, marinated with steroids and with full, full uh, access of biologic drugs. And you can do it anywhere. Collect me first, open, multiport laparoscopy. You can do it by single port surgery. And then you leave the rectum there. After six months, no drugs on board, better nutritional status. You're gonna decide better what to do. And yes, William, that's your picture there operating when I took when I was at EMC. 
Well, this is a very nice study that uh, was published by when Feza was at Cleveland, and uh, we could say that uh, this study showed that anti-TNF before surgery in ulcerative colitis can really make you change your strategy because they showed clearly that patients with anti-TNF, they had more problems in terms of septic uh, uh, complications in the pelvis when, they, when you do a pouch. So if you stage the operation in patients with anti-TNFs, it's probably safer here. If this is, again, for anti-TNFs per se, a biologic effect, or if this, this just because these cases are more severe, this still needs to be proved. But people do not believe that. I'm not debating Phil here, but I also want to show his new operating room dresses. <laughs> so his group, they demonstrated that in ulcerative colitis, if you measure serum levels here, you won't find any relation with higher complication rates. Okay, but check the number of patients there. There are a slow number of patients. They found a relation in Crohn's disease, but not in ulcerative colitis. And there's people who do not believe that as well. So there's, this is data from Liliana Bordeneau. Uh, she was just uh, publishing, this is not a big paper, but they really question the possible overuse of three-stage procedures for active ulcerative colitis, because of course, more procedures, more chances of complications. Let's take a look at the data. So the comparison between three versus two stage, and this is data from Alexandro Fiquera, who is here, laparoscopic uh, approach for these uh, procedures, you will see that there were no differences, but the numbers were small, I have to say, but there's a tendency there for more intra-abdominal abscesses and pouch leaks in the patients with, second, with two stages compared to three stage, despite an absence of statistical significance. And then this is a national trend, a study that was published by, by Robert Sima from, uh, from Mayo Clinic. And you can really see here a switch in the coin. So after 2006, nationally, you guys started to have more two-stage procedures than three-stage. So why is that happening? Because we're having maybe more cancers and dysplasias that you're increasing the two-stage procedures, or are you having better access to medical care? So 2006, if I'm not wrong, and Dr. Binion, please correct me, I think it was the approval of infliximab here in the United States, or 2005. And then you start with uh, better outcomes in terms of mucosal healing and better clinical care of the patient. So maybe this is what happened here. But if you see the outcomes of these patients in two versus three stage, you can see here that there were more problems uh, in the three stage group in terms of uh, in, in incisional surgical site infections. But the return to the operating room was significant uh, uh, and more return to the operating room in the second in two stage procedures as well as the length of hospital stay. So this, is, this comes to a point where there's a lot of uh, uh, biases there in terms of uh, the interpretation of the data. Again, data from the Cleveland Clinic showing uh, a good number of patients with the two different approaches. The three-stage procedures showed longer hospital stay, of course. These are more severe cases. And if you add the procedures in terms of days from the three, you'll have more uh, hospital length. And you can also see that there was no worsening of pouch function. So if you stage a pouch for three procedures, you don't have any differences in pouch function over time, which is very important to address. But look at this. Is it really safer? Uh, in this series that, uh, the, uh, that the Cleveland Clinic uh, physicians, uh, uh, senior by Feza, was a senior author here, you can see that there were more surgical site infections, more hemorrhage, and more small bowel obstruction in the patients with the three stage, probably because of severity. These patients were more severe than the patients selected for for two stage procedures. And this is quite a good table that summarizes everything. And we can see here, for example, the overall postoperative complications, they might be similar. But if you look at the pouch leaks, you'll see definitely that the two stage, they have more pouch leaks than the patients with three stages. So maybe delaying a pouch is a better alternative and protected with a loop ileostomy is safer for these patients. But I have to say to you that this is important selection bias. Patients with more severe disease, with malnutrition and et cetera, more drugs on board, they will naturally go for three stage. And patients without these uh, features, they will go for a two stage procedure. Okay? Let's go back to Europe now. So this is uh, historical data from one of the biggest units in Europe, uh, the Levin uh, data. Professor Andrea Dorr was a senior author of this paper, had the privilege to revise for the journal. And uh, they clearly demonstrate that they are reducing the three stage uh, procedures over time. They're doing more modified to stage, and then maybe William can address this in, in, when he's talking. But we can clearly see here in the right graph that there is a reduction in the leaks uh, uh, when they summarize the, the periods they are doing this. So there's less leaks associated with a reduction in three stages by doing the modified second stage more and more. So is this due to technical aspects or just because they're treating medically patients better? 
So this is a question I make for, for the audience, and maybe we can discuss that later. And again, it's not about staging. The transaino approach that William is going to present here, you can also do it in a three-stage. You do collect me first, you do the transaino approach, you do your anastomosis, seeing it directly, all the advantages that you might have with the transaino approach. But, uh, you know, this is not about staging. You can definitely put a loop ileostomy on that and transform this transaino in a three-stage procedure as well. So uh, I hope I'm still on time, and uh, this is my final slide, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the absolute majority of ulcerative patient, colitis patients uh, in this year refer to surgery. They are marinated with steroids. They have multiple biologics on board, and they are fully malnourished, at least in my experience. Delaying pouch formation for a second step seems safer, so we do not use the single-stage pouch procedure uh, in adults. I would be happy to uh, understand a little bit better in the pediatric world by Daniel. These three, three stage procedures, they increase the total treatment duration. Of course, it's three procedures, not two, but it seems safer in an era of high use of biological therapies and exhausted patients. But maybe I won't agree this as mandatory because we still have those patients with no medications, adequate nutritional status, and these patients with dysplasia that can easily go for a two stage procedure. There's, of course, selection bias in the three versus stage, uh, two stage comparison data that we have, and the transaino pouch can be the second stage of a three-stage procedure uh, according to what we see here, okay? Thanks for the attention, and I hope I, I, I can have a good debate and discussion with my opponents. Bye. Okay, uh, thank you. Arguing for two-stage surgery will be Dr. Will Bebelman from Amsterdam. Thank you. Well, Paolo, this was uh, great. It was funny, but not good enough. <laughs> I th I'm going to show you that the only reason to do a three-stage procedure is if you have a private practice and you need additional money for the third procedure. <laughs> so, basically, I'm going to address the modified two-stage surgery, and I, uh, I, I, I had to... Um, I took the privilege to change my title and do a more larger debate, not against only one stage and three stage, but also two stage. So I'm going to plea for a modified two stage. So this is what uh, Paolo already showed. We have one stage procedure, proctocolectomy without a stoma. We have a two stage procedure, is a proctocolectomy with a defunction stoma. And then this three stage subtotocolectomy with ileostomy then completion proctectomy with ileostomy, and then closure of the ileostomy. And then we have the two-stage, the modified two-stage procedure, where we do a subtotal colectomy and, uh, with ileostomy, and then followed by uh, completion proctectomy without a stoma. So what are we afraid of? Well, we are afraid of mortality in these patients, and functional out, uh, outcome problems and anastomotic leak. So these are data from the Dutch uh, colorectal audit looking at TME surgery. These are modern data. And as you can see, that leakage nowadays of a low anastomosis is not that much associated with mortality anymore. So our care has been improved, resulting in better management of patients with anastomotic leaks. So we should not be that much afraid of having uh, mortality uh, rates. So in pouch surgery, of course, we don't want to have an anastomotic leak uh, because anastomotic leak is associated with long-term pouch function, pouch dysfunction. So let's look at the one-stage surgery. Um, as Paolo elegantly addressed, is that most of these patients there are marinated in biologicals if it comes to surgery. So this is a combined study of the Mayo Clinics in Scottsdale, uh, Leuven, and Amsterdam, showing that uh, on the left slide, patients with steroids, and in the middle, uh, patients with anti-TNF, and on the right, both steroids and anti-TNF, they have a largely increased leak rate. So you should not do a one-stage procedure in these patients. So in the waste bucket. <laughs> So what about the two-stage procedure? So uh, proctocolectomy defunction ileostomy. Well, also in these patients, uh, we have seen that in this collaborative study 
that the leak rates were similar whether you diverted or not uh, the, the newly made pouch. So there was no increased leak rate in patients who were not defunctioned. And that the long-term uh, results of these, these pouches were similar uh, uh, in, in the groups with or without a diverting stoma. So there's no reason to do a two-stage in order to reduce the leak rate, also in the waste bucket. So then finally, the three-stage procedure. Well, also here we have similar results, no um, increased leak rates if you um, omit a, di a diverted stoma. So there's no reason to do a three-stage in order to reduce uh, your leak rate, also in the waste bucket. So let's look at, uh, at the modified uh, uh, two-stage. So most typically nowadays, patients will have the emergency uh, colectomy uh, as a laparoscopic procedure. This could be a single port or a hand assist or a straight laparoscopic uh, colectomy. And then after weaning the drugs and recovery, full recovery of the patients, three to six months later, the completion proctectomy is done and there, won't be, there will not be a defunction stoma in the two-stage procedure. I won't go into detail how we do the completion proctectomy. And nowadays, in uh, let's say a number of uh, European centers, we do uh, a top proctectomy and uh, a pouch procedure with a, a single stapling, double purstring anastomosis. But I won't go into that. Uh, so this is what we do nowadays. So single port aliostomy. Uh, have we used the, uh, the aliostomy site? Uh, to, do a, to put in a single port, do a top-down uh, proctectomy from the top, and then we make a rendezvous uh, with the TAR procedure coming from the bottom, doing a bottom-up uh, proctectomy. And this is then the result. The patient only has the stoma site and uh, the place for the pelvic drain. So from this collaborative study, and you have to realize that these data on anastomotic leaks are not in hospital, leak rates, they are not 30-day leak rates, they are one-year leak rates. So we also know the incidence of the leaks uh, only discovered prior to stoma closure. You have to realize that. So we have sh shown in this collaborative study that there's no increased risk with respect to mortality and no increased leak rates if we do not defunction the pouch in the modified two-stage. So let's look at other issues. If you do not defunction and there is a leak, you will diagnose it immediately. So you avoid the delayed diagnosed leaks. And by doing that, you can treat these patients early and you can avoid the chronic sinus, which can be a consequence of a leak, and uh, which is uh, the major contribution to a permanent stoma. I will show you that the reported 30-day leak rates are in fact the tip of the iceberg. This is a study from, uh, these are two studies I found in literature. So first of all, we had the data from uh, the AMC, Leuven and um, uh, Scottsdale showing that there was a leak rate in between 15 and 20%, 20% in Scottsdale in the diverted patients, which, which was a, a one-year leak rate. Santorelli showed the leak rates in St. Mark's, showing an early leak rate, an in-hospital leak rate of 7%, but at the end of the year, uh, these patients had a leak rate of 19%. So after doing a pouchogram, they showed another number of leaks, adding up to 90%. And then we have a U.S. center showing similar figures, Another U.S. center showing similar figures of a leak rate more than 15%. It's not published yet, so I cannot uh, refer to it. So what does a defunction stoma do? It mitigates the clinical symptoms of the leak. So you send the patient home. So they have a, let's say, silent chronic sepsis. And then prior to stoma closure, you only find the leak then. And then you're too late to manage it properly. And the chronic pelvic sepsis over time gives scarring of the pouch. And if you're able to close the stoma in the end, then the function will be compromised. So why, what's another reason for us not to divert the pouch is that um, we use a pouch drain for five days. 
and uh, we measured CRP just before taking out the pouch drain, and then after we took out the pouch drain, we recalculate the CRP, and if we have an increase in CRP, then we do immediately a CT scan. If they leak, we treat the, the patients with endosponge, and we were able to close the defect within two weeks. Of course, these patients they will have, a, uh, in a secondary uh, surgery, they will have a defunctioned ileostomy. So in this way, we have been able to avoid all the chronic sinuses in, in our pouch surgery in our series. This has been published a couple of years ago. And also the long-term function of patients who had early closure was similar to patients who did not leak, which is uh, completely different from patients who did leak, who had much higher, higher uh, failure rates. Another reason to not uh, defunction, the, the, function, the, the pouch is that possibly when the pouch is not there functioned, uh, the, uh, because of the immediate uh, use of the pouch, it can expand better and will result in a better function. There are some signs in literature about that, already an old publication uh, in the last era showing that uh, the patients who had the immediate function of their neorectum, they have better function. And we also have data from our hospital, which are not published yet, looking at the non-defunctioned versus the defunctioned pouches. We also have seen that on functional uh, scores, that in subsets of these scores, patients did better if they were not defunctioned. So what about the temporary stoma? And we know that patients with, uh, with a stoma, uh, they need to, be, need to have stoma closures and the uh, uh, stoma closure is associated with a high incidence of morbidity and even mortality in these patients. Of course, if you don't give these patients an ileostomy, you won't have these complications. And then finally, there's less small bowel obstruction if the pouch was not defunctioned. There has been signals in the literature up to now, but we had, uh, we had a big collaborative study in, in Europe uh, in, in four uh, tertiary referral centers, looking at the different stages and the small bowel obstruction at the end. And as you can see that the small bowel obstruction in the patients who had uh, one, two, or three-stage procedures was higher than in the patients who had a modified two-stage procedure without the function stoma. And probably it's the, the same reason as in the ileocolic anastomosis, that if you make a site-to-site -site anastomosis, as most of us would do if, they, if we would close an ileostomy, that it might compromise uh, the passage of stool and uh, might uh, give uh, relative small bowel obstruction. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that the winner is the modified two-stage procedure. And it's because it's only in a, a procedure which, uh, which uh, requires two operations, Patients have only for a short time they have a stoma. Possibly the pouch functions better on the long term. We can detect early the leaks and handle these leaks uh, very efficiently in order to avoid the chronic sinuses and long-term pouch failure. And, and there's a signal that there's less small bowel obstruction. I thank you for your attention. Okay, our uh, third and final speaker in this session will be Dan Von Elman from um, Cincinnati, who will be talking to us why do two when you just need one. So uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here, although I do have some concerns that as the only pediatric surgeon I've been teed up as the sacrificial lamb to talk about single stage approach. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Willem for talking about how stomas are bad and you shouldn't have one. So, sorry, there we go. If the outcomes are the same and the hospital time is reduced, why wouldn't you do this for everybody? We do have the slight issue of patient selection to discuss. So single stage procedures for uh, ulcerative colitis, this is not a new idea. This was a paper from now 25 years ago, looking at 143 patients with ulcerative colitis or familial polyposis, 
about half and half, 69 had an ileostomy or were diverted, 74 had a single stage procedure. The important selection criteria included the fact that there were no immunosuppressives, uh, certainly this was pre-biologics, and uh, patients uh, had to be on less than 20 milligrams of prednisone daily in the month preceding the surgery. Also, there were intraoperative considerations like the anastomosis had to be completely tension-free with an excellent blood supply. The results from that study were that there, was an, there were two patients who developed a pelvic abscess, one in each group, uh, no significant difference there. Uh, the leak rate was the same in both groups, so no significant difference there. The length of stay was about the same for the primary procedure, but the length of stay was significantly longer in the ileostomy group, and I apologize, those figures are transcribed. It should be longer in the ileostomy group, uh, which was significant. And there were significantly more uh, later complications, including bowel obstruction in the patients who had a diverting ileostomy. From an outcomes or a functional standpoint, uh, the frequency of bowel movements and continence were the same in both groups, and there was no change when considering only colitis patients. So this group included, uh, the overall group included uh, familial polyposis patients, but when those patients were uh, taken out, there was still no difference and the results were the same. This is also a relatively old study, but in uh, 102 patients, in which 30 had an ileostomy, 72 were done with a primary uh, procedure. And the criteria, again, were important for deciding on who had uh, what procedure. Uh, having a primary pull th or a uh, single stage pull through uh, required the absence of severe or acute colitis, good nutritional status, and again, the intraoperative assessment of a sound tension free anastomosis. Steroid intake in this study was not a contraindication to a single-stage approach. The results of this study were uh, very similar in the no ileostomy versus ileostomy group. The rate of anastomotic leak was the same. Uh, there were some ep uh, episodes of pelvic sepsis that were not statistically significantly different. Uh, the pouch fistula rate was, again, uh, slightly higher by number, but not statistically different in the ileostomy group. And the uh, incidence of intestinal obstruction was about the same. Importantly, about 8% of the patients who had uh, no initial ileostomy required a delayed stoma. But it's also important that closure of the temporary ileostomy in the ileostomy group was associated with the 10% complication rate. And I think we've heard that rate as being anywhere from 10 to uh, 20% uh, in the various talks this morning. Uh, the cumulative post-operative hospital stay was significantly less in the no ileostomy group, consistent with all the other studies. And the functional results at one year were the same. This is probably the biggest uh, and most well-controlled study specifically looking at one versus two stage procedures for proctocolectomy, restorative proctocolectomy. It's a German study. It was a matched pair control study uh, of single versus two stage. For each uh, patient in the, in the study group, there were 57 single stage. There were two in the control group uh, with 114 uh, double stage. They compared the surgical details early in the late stage outcomes. So this uh, is just a summary of the patient characteristics. Uh, you can see that the groups were essentially the same throughout. Uh, importantly, there was a almost 20% uh, percent of patients were on more than 40 milligrams of uh, steroids. The surgical details, uh, the time of surgery was slightly longer in the single stage procedure. Uh, the blood loss was essentially the same, transfusions the same, hospital stay was the same for the initial procedure, although when you add on the additional hospital stay for the closure of the ileostomy, uh, again, the two stage procedure or three stage procedure would have a significantly longer hospital stay. It's, the hospital stays in this study were quite long compared to what we uh, currently do, but, uh, but I would submit that still the difference is the same when you add on the hospital stay for the ileostomy closure. In terms of complications, uh, the complications rates, if you look at the second line down there, there were no complications in 56% of the single stage procedures, whereas there were only 33% of patients in the two stage procedure who were without any complication. 
And if you look down to the line PRSC, which is pelvic related, sep I'm sorry, pouch related septic complications, there was about a 20% incidence in both groups with no significant difference. This is looking at the incidence of uh, cumulative incidence of pouchitis uh, long term uh, over 60 months following the operation. And as you can see, there's no difference between the two groups. So just to bring in uh, the pediatric population, this is the single study that's been done. It was done by um, Dan Duty from um, Boston, looking at a pediatric population. There were 90 patients, 56 had a single stage procedure, uh, 19 had a routine two-stage procedure, 12 had a modified two-stage procedure, and three had a uh, three-stage procedure. There was one pelvic abscess in each group. Uh, they were both drained uh, and resolved with antibiotics, it was not treated with uh, reoperation. Uh, there was, uh, the small bowel obstruction rate was the same in both groups, and the outcomes were, again, the same with uh, similar um, function in terms of stools per day, which was two to six, and the same incidence of nighttime incontinence. So I would submit to you that the data on single stage procedures is somewhat limited, uh, but it's uh, and often retrospective, as with many of the studies. There is a large selection bias that we need to address in terms of patient selection, but that there is data to support single stage procedures uh, for, with equivalent outcomes and potentially fewer complications and a shorter length of stay. So as my father uh, has taught me, if you can't be informed, be opinionated. So I look forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, for, first for audience participation, may I ask for the surgeons in the audience, how many people, of course understanding that there are different patient pot selections, how many people as their go-to are doing three-stage uh, pouches? How many people are root or their usual uh, mechanism is to do two-stage pouches? Depends. How many are doing what I'll call modified two stages? And how many are doing single stage? No, as a routine, as you, Wally, you can't do it, everything and everybody. All right. <laughs> okay, exactly. All right, well, firstly, are there are any questions from the audience for starters or comments for participation? Well, I have a couple. So I don't, I don't really get this. Um, so that, you know, I feel like, you know, for those of us who have been around for a while, so we went from, oh, everyone needs three stages to everybody needs, no, you can do two. And then as Dan taught us that, you know, there's a big flurry in the 90s into 2000 that why do we do three operations when one will suffice? So all of a sudden, now we have a laparoscope, we have a toy. So now all of a sudden it's best for the patient and not for us to have three operations instead of one. Comments? So, I mean, is this a, I mean, who are we treating? Are we treating ourselves or are we treating the patients? Do we do three stages because we want to use the laparoscope or do we do three stages because it's the best for the patient? I think that uh, we do more three stages because the profile of patients in 2018 is completely different than the profile of patients pre-biological era. So in the 90s and in early 2000s, we didn't have patients marinated with uh, biologics elsewhere, you know, losing uh, a lot of weight, having malnutrition, and coming to us uh, in very severe form with steroids on board. So that's number one. Okay, that's a, I think that's a, a really uh, a change in the patient profile. Yeah, and so, uh, I'm sorry, so to, while you have the microphone, so how does that work that by a lot, a couple questions, how does that work that biologics, you know, granted the data's all over the place, like it's bad for a Crohn, it, it's fine for a Crohn's anastomosis, but it's bad for an ulcerative colitis anastomosis. How does that work? Well, first of all, to uh, get back to your first question, uh, one, two, three, or modified two stage has nothing to do with the approach. That's first. And so if you do open, laparoscopic, transanal, whatever, uh, it's, it's, it's a concept, it's a principle, and it's exactly what uh, Paolo is saying. The patients we treat now are different than the patients we treated uh, 20 years ago. And uh, when I was in training, uh, we had uh, our first 100 pouches in the AMC, 
had a leak rate of 5%, and we had a defunctioning rate of 5%, so in the end, 10% had stomas. And then, in the area of biologicals, we couldn't, couldn't have these results anymore. Leak rates went up to 15, 20% if we would do a one-stage or uh, a modified, uh, a one-stage or a two-stage. So that's why we moved to subtotals. With respect to the, um, let's say, the biologicals uh, in pouches, as opposed to, let's say, for instance, uh, ileocolicrone's disease, the pouch anal anastomosis is a much more sensitive anastomosis than an ileocolic anastomosis, and I think that explains um, uh, the, 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 the higher problem. It took us many years to show that there are more septic complications with NTT and Evan pouches. So there's, there, there, is a, uh, there's a difficulty to show it, uh, even in, in high-risk anastomosis, while in ileocolic anastomosis, uh, there are lower risk and probably the difference is, is less. Well, while you have that microphone, that didn't we learn that, um, that stretching the anal sphincter was a really bad thing? You're saying that we don't use our technology to drive what we do, that it's patient need, but didn't, haven't we been through that before, that uh, stretching the anal sphincter for an hour, you know, or two hours was a really bad thing, and that we went, we transitioned from the Phil Fleshner incontinent ileal pouch anal anastomosis <laughs> to the continent ileal pouch anal anastomosis. Didn't we learn that lesson already? Well, I, I, I think you're changing the subject now, uh, moving away from the stage procedures towards TA or, uh, let's say, top-down uh, resection, so it's another discussion. But I'm very happy to say that in uh, our collaborative data from four European centers looking at the long-term outcome of TA procedures, we showed even better function in the TA procedures. Okay, we, so know, we know from, uh, from TEM data that if, the, if there is a re reduction in, in anal function, it's only uh, temporary. Okay, so we've now learned that doing the Lord sphincter stretch is a good operation for <laughs> continence. Audience? I have a question, if it's okay. Um, so when I do an ileal pouch operating on the patient, everything in the abdomen's going fine. I'm not even really thinking of what's going on in the abdomen. What I'm thinking in the back of my mind is what's coming up in about 30 minutes from now when I start putting that pouch on stretch, and I'm trying to see how it stretches down to the anal canal. And I'm thinking that this has enormous prognostic implications for the patient. Do all your maneuvers and all types of things. You know the length is the ultimate uh, scenario, the ultimate thing that you want to get. You want to make sure you have a tension-free anastomosis. That's what I'm thinking about. The reason I'm bringing that up, and let me give you some context, as I gave you some context, but the question I have is, in the U.S., I'm just thinking, how often can we do a modified two? Because when I actually bring that pouch down, after doing a three, let's presume we did an initial subtotal. Now we're coming back and we're planning to do our, our J pouch. I t every single one of those, except for maybe a skinny young female, is under tension. And yet you guys are promoting in Amsterdam the concept of just putting it back together and sewing it even without an ileostomy. I don't know if we're seeing different patients. I don't know if it's different mob obesity issues. I don't know the answer. I think all of us as colorectal surgeons would be concerned about that. And my only other, I'd be curious about your response. Like how often can you really do this? And that's maybe why it's not uh, catching on in the U.S., because we just don't see people like this. And the other, what we'll talk about, the other thing that I'm curious about is, um, you know, the issues regarding, in terms of the stages and, and stuff like that. Um, I just don't understand. I'm, anyways, why don't you just answer that first, and we'll go from there. Can, can, can you summarize your question, please? Yeah, I'll summarize. Are you basically <laughs> saying that do you, do you I, I, think I isn't, the stretch, isn't it, it the was stretch a, it was half a lecture. the critical factor? So do you think that this technique applies to the big, heavy male, uh, someone who looks like me? You mean, you mean a modified? Modified. modified. Uh, but are, talking, are, we, are we talking about, let's say, the staging or about the approach? Uh, so uh, he, he's asking whether is it isn't it the stretch of the mesentery yeah. and the resultant tension on the anastomosis the critical defining factor of complications of ileoanal anastomotic leak and and so why is that so much better in the patient who's had a previous total abdominal colectomy as to the one who gets a total abdominal colectomy in the pouch at the same time? So. 
Did I catch your question right? That you mean you mean that My you have more length if you have a, a, a subtotal first? How can you how can you in this in this country? Okay, when we again we do yeah. our pouching anastomosis, those anastomoses are under, under tension. Yes, almost they, always. And I'm and I'm quite frankly, that's the most that's the thing that I'm always thinking about in terms yeah. of what what to do. And I, my question to you is that how then can you justify not only doing the modified two stage, but actually doing it without a stoma? In this in this country, I'd be concerned about that. Well, I, I you know if you have if you have tension, one of the uh, one of the methods to create more tension is to put up, put up a stoma. Exactly. <laughs> I agree with that completely. I don't agree and with so everything you've been saying here, but I agree. If with you that. have a very obese patient and, uh, uh, and you're aiming to do a three-stage procedure, sometimes it's not possible to do a three-stage procedure because you're not able to get the stoma out. So that's another reason I forgot as an argument to do a modified two-stage. Thank I you agree. for that. If I can jump in, I agree that so, I do a lot of modified twos and I'm going to give a talk here that talks about this a little bit. But having said that, the obese patient is the perfect patient for a modified two. Yeah. Because when you connect that pouch down and you've got that taut mesentery, now you're taking that straight line and taking it into a triangular type shape, whereby now you need even more laxity to create the stoma because you're tenting it up through a very thick abdominal wall. So I actually predetermined doing a modified two patient, modified two procedure in an obese patient. I got a happy, happy patient with dysplasia on their colectomy. I will first do a total abdominal colectomy and then come back later to do a modified two. So I don't need to create that loop biliostomy. So why not Dr. in all patients then? Dr. Ramsey? Thank you, Dr. Fleschner and Dr. Colton, allowing the rest of us to be able to ask some couple of questions. <laughs> so uh, the, the point, it's more of a statement uh, and I followed by a question. Willem, I truly appreciate you made the point saying this is not about the approach. This is about the philosophy of modified two-stage. I think that really needs to come across uh, stronger because it's, it can be misinterpreted. So I thank you so much making that point clear. So this modified two-stage goes back to the, uh, you're much older than me, but I still remember some of the things, Neil, goes back to the Toronto group who actually initiate this thing. Then the in Cleveland, uh, Vic Fazio, Scott, and I, we took this, we published like, over 300 two-stage modified pouches or so one-stage pouches. It can be done. It can be safely done. Selection is key. I personally stopped doing it for the reasons that you talked about, geographical aspect of the United States. Where these patients go, I have no control over. One patient was life, uh, life flighted, the other got in the ileus pouch, was excised, so I stopped unless they're local. So, point, modified stage two stage, I think it's a great pr procedure for the points you guys made, especially a big guy. As long as it can be condensed to one side, you have a control of what's going on. Because if things don't go wrong, it can be a major issue. I just want to make that state. Thank you, Dr. Kaitov. When we have that obese patient and then we create this difficult ileostomy and then we choose not to do that, we, so we do modified stage for obese patient, they still could leak. And then you kind of trap yourself into very difficult scenario once they actually leak. Wait, let him, let him finish, go ahead. So I'm be, I've been through that, so for the same exact reason, to decrease the tension through the abdominal wall, I've done that, and then they actually leak. And then, then you really pin to the wall, and then this is a bad situation, when you have to create the ileostomy, and then... So, so Dr. Colton, the question is really, so you're saying that it's, joy, it's easier, it's better when obese patients leak? No, I'm saying that they don't leak. <laughs> I'm saying that they don't leak. I mean, so they, you're saying that obesity, tension, that the adipocytes tension, heal this very sensitive anastomosis. So I'm sorry, so you're saying the adipocytes heal this very sensitive anastomosis that Dr. Bemelman's been talking about, that the hand port makes it insensitive now? Well, and you're all, saying that the adipocytes make it heal? No, uh, the adipocytes are bystanders. They have nothing to do with it. But the point is, is that if tension is your concern, you worsen the tension by creating a loop ileostomy. And that tension is that much greater in the obese patient trying to get through that thick abdominal wall, that's all. 
And so and the super obese patient, and I've done this in BMIs of 40, and I try to make them lose weight ahead of time. They rarely do. It's like trying to get your Crohn's patient to stop smoking. But the point is you can do a total abdominal colectomy and ileostomy. Very straightforward. can be done. Then you come back and do a modified two. Six months later, no stoma, no tension, on the, no added tension on the anastomosis, the iliohanal anastomosis, because you're not creating that added traction to create the loop ileostomy. And in my hands, I haven't had a single leak, period. So I just think that that's a better way of doing it. And there is literature that suggests modified twos have a much lower leak rate than a conventional two. A conventional two has a diverting stoma, and that leak rate is higher than a modified two without a stoma. So we saw data that the leak rate might be, when you really examine, it's 15 to 20 percent. So I'm just wondering how you get these magical results in the obese patients where you get no leaks. So I'm saying, should we have all the patients do weight gain before they have surgery? <laughs> what, you, stay put and listen to my talk in the next session, and you'll be Neil. educated. Maybe it is, after all, we are in the magical kingdom. Maybe that's part of it, right? Neil. Yes. Let me just make, uh, I just want to make a question to Bellman here uh, regarding, for example, patient with ulcerative colitis, no medication with the dysplasia. So why instead of doing a modified two stage, why don't you do it straight, uh, a one stage procedure? And you're the first author of ECHO guidelines, which says you cannot do this. We want to own the authors of that. So the rationale of modified two stage, can you apply it as a one stage in a patient like this? Well, of course, Paolo, we are all defending one procedure here. So, but of course, it's not black and white. And uh, if you have a patient, uh, uh, let's say, with FA FAP, of course you do a one-stage procedure. Or if you have a patient with uh, uh, dysplasia uh, 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 in the rectum or whatever, you can do a one-stage procedure if they have no medication. So, of course, there's a role for one stage, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, very limited. I think there's no role in patients who are treated for refractory inflammatory disease of the colon because they're marinated in uh, biologicals. Dr. Kara? So I think the interval between the first and the second step is the key here. Because six months, and I do three, my partners do six weeks. Uh, the, in six months, this is a normal patient. Wind off all the steroids, all the biologics. So I think the key in your approach, number one, is your skills and technique and everything else. And in part also, seeing that anastomosis so clearly when you do it from the bottom is also the fact that you wait six months like Dr. Colton. And I think it, six months gives you a chance to lose some weight, but also primarily get them off all these uh, toxins. Is it waiting six months or is it waiting until they're off their biologics and they're, I mean, I don't think there's a, no, there's a time frame. I think it's, it should be dictated by the patient's clinical course. Yeah. Now the, the biologicals can be, seen in the blood up to 12 weeks after uh, stoppage of the biologicals, but we don't know about, bio the, let's say, the long-term effect, uh, the biological effect uh, uh, yeah. of having had biologicals, yeah. so well, it may be even longer. I think that's a very key point, is that we act like we know what the biologics do, and in fact we don't, and we group them together, and you know, the question is, will the anti-integrins, which the you know, are completely different classes of medications, you know, will that cause us to rethink, you know, how we approach biologics? So I think we saw, talk about marinating in steroids and marinating in biologics. I don't think they're the same thing. Dr. Colton? Um, this is for Dr. Bemelman, because I don't quite understand your rationale that you avoid a stoma in order to then discover the leak in a more rapid fashion, because is not the treatment in large part for such a leak a stoma? It's sort of circular argument, is it not? You're going to give the patient a stoma after they have an anastomotic leak, and yet you avoid a stoma so that you can discover the anastomotic leak? Um, well, first of all, if you have a, suppose you have a leak rate of 10%, it means that you give nine patients for nothing a stoma. Well, okay. Why do you give them a stoma? Because you're afraid of the, the, the consequences of the leak. Uh, the pelvic sepsis. Uh, I showed you that mortality is not an issue anymore nowadays, uh, uh, particularly if you diagnose early. The other consequence is, is uh, let's say, chronic pelvic sepsis resulting in pouch failure. There are lots of data around showing that pelvic sepsis is associated with pouch failure. If you wait three months before you uh, diagnose the leak prior to closure of your stoma, 
Then you're too late. But, but how many of those do you have? How many, how many times do you do a gas graph and enema and find a leak? I mean, it's rare. Well, I showed you two publications where they had one in Europe, one in, in the US, where they had a 30-day leak rate of 5% five and five in one and 7% in the other. And then at three that's months... That's acceptable. That's at three, Yeah, that's nice. That's, that's what they all report. But then after three months, an additional 10% adds up to this figure when they do a pouchogram. So these 10% of patients had a subclinical leak, which is there for three months. And then you cannot do anything anymore. The pouch has been compromised already because of three months of chronic sepsis. That's, what I, that's why I want to diagnose the leak as soon as possible, let's say within five days, five, six days, in order to treat it accurately. Ac Can't can you do that with a, with a stoma still being on board? Can't you do your CRP and your, an exam, a CT scan or something like that if you're so concerned about this long-term consequence? So the other, the other thing is that, so if we put up a stoma, it's not that we never put up a stoma, never is always 15%, I always say. Um, um, so if we, if we give the patient a stoma, we are not going to check the anastomosis after three months. If we're considering closing the stoma, we're going to check it after two weeks. Because if we have a silent we a leak, we can treat it still, let's say, shortly after the index operation. For those patients that you Could, treat... Uh, I'm sorry, just, uh, we, just one more question. Dr. Strong's been uh, waiting. Of course, that's the advantage. We have the endosponge. You don't have it, and I hope you get it as soon as possible in order to enjoy the, let's say, the good results yeah. of it. Yeah, so we had it in 2010, 11, and then they pulled it back. Yeah. So, and I don't see it coming back in the near future. And so how does the endosponge impact your willingness to do this two-stage approach, the modified two-stage approach? Well, it's... it's um, not about staging with the endosponge. It's, uh, let's say, an efficient management of a leak. And essential in the endosponge treatment is that you start it quickly uh, and not after three months, because then you don't have a chance to, uh, let's say, uh, save, save the negative, save the pouch and, the, the, the consequen and prevent the consequences of a leak on the pouch. So it, it's, uh, let's say, it's a plan B if I, have a, if I counsel a patient for a pouch, I, I tell them I have a 10% leak rate. So one, of, one out of 10 have a leak, but then I have a plan B. You will get a stoma, you put in an endosponge, and within two weeks, we close the hole. Okay, hold on one second. So I'm sorry to have interrupted you. So we can, we're, we're at time. So certainly we welcome people to come up. I want to thank our three speakers for their wonderful presentations and the debate. And thank you very much.